so today uh, I'm excited to speak about this topic, which is uh, virtual and augmented reality uh, in spine surgery. And I think uh, we're just at the very beginning of, of exploring and, and finding new applications for this amazing technology. I have no relevant disclosures, but I want to start by saying that it's really good that time heals all wounds because this is a picture of one of my co-speakers, uh, Esan Jazini's ankle, because we went to Albert Einstein Medical School together. And this is actually a picture taken in medical school when I, when I crossed him over on the basketball court. And uh, I'm happy you're doing better and that you're a, you're a very successful spine surgeon and doing great things out there. So. Um, so today I'll just talk about spinal virtual reality, augmented reality, where we are and where we're going. And I want to focus on three areas. The first is benefit to the patient as far as comprehending the surgery that they're going to have. And we're studying informed consent and seeing if, you know, this technology can help a patient be more informed before having surgery. In addition, uh, there's, there's obviously tremendous benefit in training the next generation of spine surgeons. And then to me, the most exciting area is the intraoperative applications, and that's growing every day as we'll kind of touch on briefly. First, some basic definitions. Uh, what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is you put your head into a headset and you're in whatever you're looking at's headset. So it's a computer generated simulation of a three-dimensional image, and it can help with education and preparation for spine cases through simulation. The important thing about virtual reality is that it's a controlled setting. So if you are practicing putting a screw in and you hit the spinal cord, that's the, that's the place to make that mistake because it's a risk-free environment and that's how you learn by, by uh, practicing in a virtual reality realm. Augmented reality, as opposed to virtual reality, is when you're looking at the, the actual physical world in front of you, but you're merging it with the virtual world. So the user has a wearable item with a display of relevant anatomy projected onto their physical view. And the idea of augmented reality, as you know, virtual reality is focusing on training and education, but augmented reality can enhance the procedural and intraoperative environment. And uh, we are doing a lot of work where we combine uh, intraoperative navigation with microscope integration. So that's a form of augmented reality where you're like a pilot and you see the runway projected onto your view you're a surgeon and you have the view of all relevant anatomy and pathology to the case you're doing. And you don't need to put a navigation probe to the patient and then look away at the navigation screen. You have a constant uh, focus attention on the surgery. And really uh, in spine, we're actually already late to the game um, because this is a cranial case that we did. And you see that in the cranial OR, we already have a lot of amazing technologies that are being applied every day. So. We have 3D goggles, we have virtual reality renditions of pathology, we have augmented reality and navigation uh, with the microscope. So this is the relevant anatomy projected onto a scalp of an arteriovenous malformation. That's after you remove the, the skull and you are looking at the dura and you have all the relevant information. So we're late in spine. Um, but things are picking up. Just in 2020, we have three major publications uh, from all over the world. So this is from uh, Italy, Sweden, and Switzerland, and everyone is kind of exploring new uses of augmented reality, and, it, and I think it's a very hot topic. And Adrian Elmi Tarander has really been one of the most prolific uh, people, and, he, and I got to meet him recently, and he's, he has a lot of great vision for where this is going. But he showed that augmented reality without fluoroscopy uh, had higher accuracy than freehand technique for thoracic pedicle screws. And this is just, you know, this, the research we're going to have to do to show that this is uh, going to be very valuable because that's the challenge ahead of us is we have to demonstrate value and, and show that it's not just cool, but it has important applications uh, for the future. So despite all of this interest and the publications, the practical applications today in spine surgery are quite minimal. And now things are going to start changing because we do have an FDA cleared augmented reality device uh, with Augmetics and X-Vision uh, that has been showed to be accurate. And I think uh, this is incredible technology. You wear this headset, which is, you know, one of the major th one of the major things that we hear as a question is, is this is it comfortable to be wearing these headsets? And and the answer is, at least in this case, it's it's very comfortable um and well designed so it's it's really uh it's not like burdensome to put this on in fact if you're doing a tough case and you want to put it on and take it off and put it on it, it's really easy to slip on and off but the idea is you put uh, some sort of tracker on a spinous process clamp um and you're immediately registered and you have 
and, and the first time you try this, and I'm sure a lot of people have it, a lot of the, the courses they have booths set up, the first time you put it on, it really is like a, an amazing, uh, it's like earth shattering because all of a sudden you have x-ray vision and you can see the spine through the skin and you have everything relevant projected onto your view and it's amazing, amazing technology. So let's go into some real cases. This is the first time we use virtual reality at Mount Sinai for a spine case. This was a 72 year old male. He presented with a worsening neck pain and left-sided weakness. Um, and uh, he had a left Hoffman, so he was hyperreflexic. And we, the first consult went to IR for a biopsy, but they said there was no easy access. So they called neurosurgery. And during this process, he actually got a little weaker and his left side became three out of five. But you see on the imaging that he has this C3 vertebral body lesion and there's epidural uh, enhancement uh, behind basically C2 to four. And on the axial, you see that it's worse on the left, but it really is kind of circumferential around the cord. So we have a C3 bony lesion with epidural tumor from C2 to 5, dorsal and ventral to the spinal cord. We did a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis that was negative. And we did an MRI of the entire neuroaxis, including the brain that was negative. So this was the only lesion we were able to, we were able to locate. So I thought I'd open it up to the floor briefly uh, to ask what would you do and uh, what the diagnosis is. Uh, but for the sake of time, I think I'm going to keep going. So, but to me, the harder question, these are the questions we always pose in conference, you know, what would you do and what do you think it is? But I think a harder question and one that I'm really personally interested in is how can we explain this to the patient in a way that he or she better understands the surgery, better understands the risks, the benefits and the alternatives. So this is a video that we show to the patient. It's a virtual reality reconstruction of their CAT scan, their MRI fused together with relevant anatomy painted. It does not take long. And you see this you know, beautiful uh, reconstruction of this patient's anatomy. And you see how it's worse on the left side. You see where it is in relation to the spinal cord. And the patient can look at this. They can put on VR goggles. They can, they can literally spin the model around and look at it from all dimensions. This was, this was done with surgical theater. And the, the patients have this aha moment where all of a sudden uh, it makes sense and they understand it. So what we did was we did a posterior cervical decompression and tumor biopsy. And uh, it came back as diffuse low-grade follicular lymphoma. So credit to Wendy Gibbs for getting it right on Twitter, uh, the, first, the first correct response. Um, I, I was surprised you didn't say uh, concretely diffuse low-grade follicular lymphoma, yeah, it, it, you know, but still uh, very impressive nonetheless. Yeah, we're, we're very disappointed in you, Wendy. I mean, how can you yeah, not get that? Very disappointed. Uh, but this was, uh, you know, it just shows I, I'm new to Twitter, but I, I think it's amazing. There was a lot of amazing feedback we got, even on that short, short chain. And, and it's great. It's, it's a great tool to use. So then uh, here's our second case. This is a 39 year old male who presented to the emergency room uh, with weakness in all four extremities, gait imbalance, falls, paresthesias, and he had urinary incontinence for one day. And his MRI was not all that impressive, with the exception of this massive uh, C67 disc herniation. So we took this, you know, he met surgical criteria and we had, you know, this is what we document in our chart. You're at risk for coma and death and stroke and paralysis and dysphagia and esophageal injury. And I think when you throw all this at a patient, even if you patiently go through each one, I think patients are overwhelmed. And I think for a lot of patients, it goes in one year out the other. And if you ask them to recall these, these risks 10 minutes later, maybe they can list 10%. So I think, you know, we have to do better at helping patients understand what the surgery is, how we're going to come in from the front of their neck and do the surgery. And this is, you know, for this patient, we showed them this video and we have the esophagus, we have the carotid, the jugular. We show them the angle, how you can come in from the front, how from the back, you can't move the spinal cord out of the way to do the surgery. And that's why we do this anterior approach. And you see that the, we, sh we show them the intraoperative view and we can, even we can even show them and even let them participate uh, in, in doing the actual surgery. And you show them how we remove the disc, we put in a cage, and how we put a plate on the front. And I think, again, it's this aha moment, like, you know, you can talk for an hour and they'll never understand it until as well as they will if you show them this video and, and let them uh, see what we do. And we're trying now to, you know, explore this and, and, and uh, we have this questionnaire we're doing in all patient consultations, we're showing them this virtual reality model and we're seeing if, if, if it helps. And, and so far, in the 25, 30 we have, the feedback has been uh, all solid. And then I'm sure everyone's uh, sick of speaking about COVID as I am, but I think that for sure in a role of telemedicine and, and patient consultations with uh, telemedicine, I think there's definitely a role for this to enhance 
the the telemedical consult and uh, that that for sure this this can fit into that realm as well the, uh, i'll shift gears unless john you want to you want to pause here or should we should we keep going um let's let's keep going john actually before you uh before you continue uh i had a question on my own so it looks like so the you're using virtual reality right now um, to essentially enhance the patient the intra uh, intra office consult and the patient experience, so you, you have kind of a um, and so they're wearing. I'm just trying to picture this. So they're wearing goggles. You're you're kind of guiding them through, showing them the spine, showing them the relevant anatomy, and you let them participate almost like a video game uh, in their in their surgery. And then the augmented reality, you're using that more kind of as a functional tool in the OR. Right, like that, that's something where you actually see an overlay, a virtual overlay over the patient while they're in surgery and you can, let's say, put in screws, do a decompression, whatever. Absolutely, I think to simplify it, where we are today, and things of course are changing, but I think virtual reality is amazing for a teaching tool, a patient engagement tool, a patient education tool, and then augmented reality is where we're gonna bring it into the OR and help us in, do the surgery. And I didn't, I didn't want to go too many, you know, slides on the publications, but there was a recent paper that showed with augmented reality, you can improve your ability to bend the rod and predict, you know, how the rod is going to be bent. And to me, there's nothing better than something simplifying the rod at the end of the case when I'm exhausted and, that, and it can be the most frustrating <laughs> part of the case. So I, you know, there's so many, there's so much unknown and there's so many areas to explore, but absolutely augmented reality for peri procedural enhancement. You know, I think also um, to add to that is that, uh, you know, you know, people are, I've seen surgeons um, offer, let's say like kind of um, already pre-made videos going through the surgery, showing the steps. But I think that's a very different, still, I think, I feel like if the patient doesn't really have much um, pre, uh, pre-knowledge or pre-existing knowledge about that surgery, watching that video doesn't really mean anything to them. It's very different when they're there with you and you're explaining things, this is this, this is that, guide them through the surgery seeing their own anatomy in that, in that kind of um, realm is, is very, very, very unique, very interesting. 100%, because there, there are these amazing videos on YouTube of like a minimally invasive T-lift, for example. But if it's not, yeah. you know, it's, the, it's like you said, it's their own, and they're looking at their own anatomy and understanding, you know, what their spine looks like and what we're going to do. Hey, Jeremy, what's the, uh, what's the pre-work that's needed for uh, augmented reality in the OR? Is it just a matter of getting a CT scan and getting a uploaded into some kind of system or thin cut CT um, or an intraoperative spin. And, and, you know, now we're often getting an intraoperative spin anyway. So, you know, like for me, like the rollout process for augmented reality is I, you know, uh, for me, I want to prove my, I want to increase my comfort with time. So, you know, I might do use it on my first case on an open case, and like get ready to put a screw in, like have it all ready and then put on the goggles and see how well it correlates. Maybe put a few screws in, you know, and just gradually work up to trusting it uh, with time. I think that's, I think the same way we did it with the robot, you know, like uh, just a gradual increase in, uh, in utilization. Um, and we'll get, and we'll get to like the procedural stuff, uh, which is the most exciting area at the end. But, um, you know, as far as to shift gears now to, to training and education and the value to medical students, interns, residents, fellows, advanced practice providers, I mean, uh, it's, it's infinite, um, especially with the workout regulations. And, um, but to me, one, one thing that's been very surprising is the attending by the attendings have really started to pick up on this. And I, I think I see the attendings using it now more than anybody, I think, because that maybe they know the subtleties of what, what to look for beforehand to see the challenges they're going to get into during the case. And like, you know, on a MIST lift, maybe like, you know, the facet anatomy and how much of the SAP you take off and stuff like that. So um, I think that, uh, that that's been very interesting to see the attendings. So this is, uh, I'm not going to dwell too much, but this is, we showed virtual reality to the, the, the whole OR staff, the, but including the anesthesiologist, the surgical tech, and the circulating nurse. And it was interesting that, you know, we looked at, do you understand the surgery? Do you understand the complications? Did this help you accomplish your role in the OR? And I think the benefit was really across the board. Like, of course, the medical students, the residents enjoyed it, but I think the fact that the surgical techs loved it, this is on a scale of one to 10, and the, the circulator nurse, you know, help them get what they're going to need during the case. I think that's like uh, a really interesting area to explore, you know, how we can help everybody in the OR to understand the case. But this is how now we're teaching the medical students. We're sitting them down with a virtual reality model. 
we're showing them the anatomy. This is someone, you know, practicing a lateral mass screw. You know, we're teaching them about the, you know, the different Roy Camille, et cetera, aiming up and out, avoid the vert, avoid the exiting nerve. And uh, just imagine when you were a medical student, how, how beneficial this would be to understand, uh, you know, before the case. And then, you know, getting the opportunity to drill a trough for a laminectomy as a medical student and to understand it. And then they come into the case and they see it and it's like, okay, I get it. I, I just did it on that virtual, uh, on that virtual model. And it's, it's uh, really beneficial to the, uh, the students. And then of course, the most exciting area, how can we help surgeons uh, in the OR? And this is where I see this taking off uh, at a rapid, rapid pace. So this is uh, the magic leap system of brain lab. This is surgical theater. A lot of companies now are working on, uh, on being the next big uh, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality platform. But so our first project was, you know, a, historically a lateral interbody approach and fusion is carries a lot of morbidity, which is often debated and, you know, high rates of uh, leg pain and proximal thigh numbness are cited. But certain patients are better candidates than others. So our first project was to map the lumbosacral plexus and map our approach on a lateral interbody fusion. And this might help determine candidacy. Is this patient a good candidate for a lateral approach? And also potentially minimize the risk of a deficit. And this is the view of what we have in a lateral interbody fusion. You have the psoas, you have the disc space, and you have this structure running over the front. And this ended up being a nerve. And uh, you know, this patient you know, you have to be very careful, obviously, to prevent any sort of postoperative deficit. And I think the idea of applying this, mapping out their plexus and doing this kind of tailor designed approach, even even up to the incision level uh, in getting down and getting access to this, this patient, you know, has a is, is, is probably a decent candidate for an L4-5 because their plexus is relatively posterior. Some other ones, the plexus might be lying over the disc space. And then, you know, I would definitely want to avoid a lateral fusion in that patient. And this is now we're transitioning to augmented reality. This is you're looking at the room. So you have, you're, you're looking at the room around you, but you have the patient's name, their vital signs in the background, but you could also have their CAT scan. You could have their sagittal axial coronal reconstructions. You can simulate a deformity. You can simulate deformity correction. If you have a tough case and you have a small pedicle with a tough angle on a, on a lopsided spine, you can pull the vertebrae out and look at it in different dimensions. And of course, practice uh, putting screws in. This, was, this, is with, uh, this one was with surgical theater. And uh, as far as uh, augmented reality, you know, we can literally, before a case, just practice. We can pull up the model in our office. It doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of effort. And just do a quick run through. You can look at and anything you possibly need to see. We had one patient recently who had an anomalous vertebral artery loop going out in their foramen. And we were able to kind of decide if we we're going to go anterior or posterior. And we ended up going posterior. But there's, there's the, the applications are endless. And that's why I already see that Jonathan Razuli has uh, picked up his own virtual reality model and he's already practicing on his model. So that was a quick, quick uptake there. Um, but in conclusion, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality have many potential applications in spine surgery. And I, I, you know, I'm, I just quickly highlighted today the patient counseling, the education of the next generation, Periprocedural enhancement, but I think the key is more. And, and every day there's new papers coming out with new applications, decompressions, rod bending, taking out tumors with heads up display in the spinal cord. But the applications are going to undoubtedly expand and improve. And uh, we just need more research, innovation, and collaboration going forward. And um, thank you for your time and, and for having me. Jeremy, thank you so much. That, that was awesome, man. Um, a couple of questions from the audience. Um, <clears throat> have you heard of any of our international colleagues using this, um, like just not, not just here in the United States, but have you seen other people kind of in, uh, sites across the world using this? How, what's been the adoption rate of this technology from what you've seen? So it's brand new. So I don't even think we, I, certainly in the United States, we don't have the adoption rate yet. Uh, I know there's a, a ton of interest across every hospital system I've, I've spoken to, um, I think in certain places where it's less hard to get FDA approval and stuff like that, I think it's being picked up earlier. But what's amazing to me though, is how, you know, you look at what's being done in other countries and it's not necessarily the same augmented reality platform that we think of, you know, they have almost like a fluoro suite, the way they do IR procedures. They have like, uh, you know, the two, the two x-rays and they're doing spins with that. And then, and then putting tracers on the patient and doing augmented reality projections based on those tracers so that it, you know it's it depends on where you are 
uh, and it depends on FDA approval, and it depends on all. But I think uh, I think the uptake it's impossible to predict with certainty. I, I think it's going to be a, a, a very very fast update, and I think Asan's going to highlight the robotics, but. I think one major difference between robotics and augmented reality, even though I think they're going to move together, but a robot is a million dollars and these platforms are maybe one tenth of that. Right, so right. I think the, the, they're much more affordable. And for that reason, I think that's another reason why they might uh, get quicker, quicker uptake. Mm -hmm. What about um, revision cases when there can be, um, I think, you know, can I ask that of, question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, sure. I'll go ahead. ask it just because it was my question. So it's the imaging part. Um, well, so first I asked a while ago, how long does it take you to create these? You said it doesn't take long, but what does that mean? Half hour, 10 minutes? Yeah, so my initial exposure was with cranial neurosurgery. And we used to, I would say the first time we, we did, we painted everything. It took us maybe three hours. And then it took us two hours and one hour and 30 minutes. And we got it down to a point where it was probably like 20 minutes. And... And it just keeps getting faster because you get more familiar and the staff gets more familiar and the residents get more familiar, you know, but I think, um, I think it, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it starts out slow and gets very quickly. Okay. And that might, so my follow-up question that Rosalie was starting to ask was if you already have hardware, your imaging is going to be bad because you're going to have a lot of streak, you know, so if it's a revision case, is that going to be harder to create something like this? Or do you, have you found a way to overcome that? Because it's all based on whatever you're starting with in terms of imaging, right? Absolutely. I think though, you know, we, we did a revision case recently, posterior cervical prior fusion adjacent segment disease, classic, you know, presentation. And we did a recon and because the CT quality ended up being good, even though the MRI was definitely, you know, not ideal, we were able to really, uh, you know, appreciate a lot of the facet changes and the, we, you know, I, I should have put that in. We have like the, the screws and rods you see perfectly in the virtual reality model. So I think actually on revision cases, it, it helps, if not more, the same as, as a virgin case, I think, okay. because it really, it, it does this, the CAT scan reconstruction helps. Nice. Okay. Go ahead, Rosalie, more questions. I'll, I'll refrain from any more right now. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, a couple more questions for you. Um, how do you feel uh, augmented reality has impacted either positively or negatively or possibly even neutrally um, uh, training for residents and their ability to kind of quickly adopt or, or APPs and their ability to um, kind of come in the OR prepared and, and, and pick up, you know, what you're doing very, you know, quickly? I think it goes back to that the the virtual reality slide of teaching lateral mass screw and, and drilling the spinous process i think I, I just know myself if i had gotten that training on a model I, I i feel like it would just make me feel so much more comfortable on the or particularly you could do it on, on like a beautiful clean spine but if you do it on a spine a spine that has you know the facets aren't a perfect lateral mass you know you have to drill part of the facet to see the lateral mass or they're overgrown and spondylotic um, so I think, I think particularly because you can do it on a specific patient before you go in the OR and then see that specific patient live, I think, I think that rehearsal before a case is if you, if you have enough time and interest to do it, it's, it's like, uh, infinitely valuable to, to the person who's, who's willing to, to practice beforehand. Yeah, t totally. I think there's something different about, uh, doing that than on a like, kind of a plastic model, you know? it's a little bit more, um, you know, you get kind of bored very easily <laughs> with those. And I find myself not really paying attention, but with, with that kind of VR setting, it's, it's more interesting. It's kind of playing like almost like a video game in a way. And, um, you're, you're learning. And then, uh, also I think these systems are getting more sophisticated. We actually have haptic feedback. We actually have something to, to feel. It's not just, you know, moving your hands in air. There's, there's some sort of, uh, like a, a sensation of touch when you're putting in the, the screws or, or whatever. So the technology is getting more advanced. <laughs> Um, and then the last question is, uh, what, do you, what do you think are, are barriers to entry uh, right now for spine surgeons to adopt this technology? Why, why do you think it's not, you know, I know the technology is very new, but what, why do you think people are, haven't really like picked up this technology? What, what's, what's slowing its adoption? I think it's probably a combination of two things. One is cost. And I think, uh, you know, 
that it, not that it's as expensive as some other products, but certainly it's, it's a cost. And, and I think it's hard to demonstrate certain values, right? Like if I talk about value to medical students and trainees, how is that going to appeal to a hospital to say, oh, our, our, our medical students are really much better now and our residents are much better. Like how, how are you going to prove that and, sh and, and demonstrate value? I think that's one thing. And the second thing I think is a lot of people are set in their ways. And, and, and I think the more we do to put out papers showing its value and how it helps in, in different realms, I think the more, the more interest there will be and the more uptake there will be. Totally agree. But then again, I'm, I'm very biased. I, I'm like, I totally buy into this technology. I think it's fantastic and you're doing fantastic things, Jeremy. So um, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. All right. So let's start with, um, uh, let's, can you, if you can unshare your screen and we'll have uh, S on um, pull up his presentation. So uh, Dr. Jazzini um, is also a very close friend of mine. He is an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Virginia Spine Institute. Um, he did his residency at the University of Maryland and did his fellowship at Leatherman. And he's going to be discussing uh, the use of uh, clinical and practical applications of robotics uh, in spine surgery. And uh, we thank you for being here, Asan. Thank you. That was a great presentation, Jeremy. I, want, I also want to add my thoughts on, on Augmetics. I think that it's going to complement robotics. I think uh, it's going to be a different, it's going to bring a different aspect to what we can do in terms of our ability to train residents and fellows and also help surgeons prepare for surgery and it's a technology we're actually bringing to our hospital as well. So uh, that was a great presentation and I think it's gonna bring a lot of value. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm gonna talk about robotics and spine surgery and I'm really gonna talk about our experience at Virginia Spine Institute, the spearheaded with Dr. Good. Uh, this is a more than an eight year experience and so I'm gonna really touch base on really how we've been able to progress this technology and really apply it to for our patients. Here are my disclosures. Uh, so I'm going to first uh, hope that throughout this talk, I'm going to be able to dispel some of the myths about robotic surgery and really go over the clinical application, how this has progressed over the years, and then talk about what's on the horizon for robotics. So some of the myths that you hear about robotic surgery is, you know, it's only used for, for uh, screw placement or it's only used for, for simple cases, that it's adding more operative time and radiation and it's most, more costly. Uh, so robotics is really an interplay between hardware and software. So here's the actual robot and I'm gonna uh, showcase what the software looks like. And this technology really is uh, a technology that is able to segment the spine to the different individual levels. Here you can see the axial spine and the sort of sagittal view of the spine. Here's a coronal view. And you can really go ahead and plan your screws. And this video is just showing how you can plan your axial screw, uh, your pedicles in the axial view. And then you can move over to the uh, sagittal view. Here's the pedicle is a little bit obviously high on, on the pedicle, uh, but you're able to really maximize the fit of your pedicle and make sure that you're also getting the maximum, maximum length. And the next video, we'll show how this, the hardware aspect of this looks like. Here's the actual robot. And you're gonna see um, my, my senior partner, Dr. Good actually go ahead and now cannulate using the tap, the actual pedicle. And you can in real time see that go in on the axial and sagittal view. And through the same cannula, you can actually go ahead and place your screw. So here is the the actual hardware uh, and the interplay between the software and the hardware uh, that you can see on this video. You know, what did it look like before? This is the fluoro guided uh, percutaneous screws. This is something a lot of us are familiar with. You know, training at shock trauma, I did a lot of percutaneous screws for patients with first fractures and I saw a lot of the issues with, with the K-wire, with uh, the poor imaging quality, and we actually looked at facet joint violations, and we found that despite the different types of techniques used, you had about 10% rate of facet joint violation, which is, which is a big problem in causing adjacent segment disease. And with the robot, you can really make sure that you're staying away from the joints at the levels that you're not fusing to, to avoid that problem. 
So here's a, a picture of percutaneous screws being done with the robot in a very precise way. And the other main advantage is, you know, I'm sure a lot of patients have dealt with patients with a big body habitus, high BMI, where you can't really make out the anatomy. It's really hard for you to see the pedicles. Uh, you know, where is the actual anatomy when you're trying to introduce your Jamshi needle? And what the robot is able to do, it's, it's able to take the modality from CAT scan and interplay it with the floral image to really give you precise uh, landmarks so that you can place your screws accurately. We've also had dealt with patients like this, right, who um, we're really trying to go away from this, right? This is an open, traditional T-lift with soft tissue injury, and we're trying to move to this, right? This is minimally invasive surgery where you can really plan your screws, plan your incisions, and minimize the trauma to your patients and make sure they're leaving the hospital faster. And so this is a, a, the refresh study. This is a prospective study that was done comparing floor guided surgery to robotic surgery, looking at complication rates, and there's a five times lower risk of complication, nine times lower risk of revision, and 76% less fluoro. So there's a lot of less fluoro that's being used. In fact, I don't wear lead in the OR when I'm doing robotics. Now I'm gonna move over to the application of pelvic fixation. Here is someone who uh, had a T11 to pelvis, had pseudoarthrosis of 5.1, and prox uh, proximal junctional uh, kyphosis. And you can go ahead and just plan your uh, S2AI screws, your iliac screws, even though you have a screw here before, a previous iliac screw, you can put uh, adjacent S2AI screw next to it and really plan out your accessory rod. So here's a patient who had a dual rod uh, technique and the, the proximal junctional kyphosis was extended proximally. Here's another patient with both coronal and sagittal mal malbalance that you're able to uh, place an accessory iliac screw as a kickstand rod technique to be able to correct someone's coronal malbalance beautifully. Here's a case, now we're moving over to scoliosis surgery. How, how could we apply robotics to scoliosis surgery? This is a patient with not a great uh, host, right? She has cortical pedicles, severe osteoporosis, progressive deformity with restrictive lung disease. You can maximize your pedicle fit, you can maximize the length of these screws and place by cortical screws in able to uh, correct your deformity and great, uh, get a great result. You know, we started first with open robotic surgery in terms of scoliosis. This is a 90 degree, 90 degree curve. You can maximize, again, your, your screw sizes and your screw fit and purchase to do a great correction and, and uh, get this patient off the table. You know, moving over now to, this is uh, AIS, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, where there's more flexibility to, to the spine. And I think this is a beautiful software. This is the x software where it really allows you to both be able to place these bicortical screws when the pedicles are very narrow, but also plan out what that will look like, what the correction will look like before surgery to be able to know, okay, where are the rods gonna sit? Where is, how much bend do I need the rod? Uh, what kind of correction am I gonna be able to achieve? And really plan your surgery before you, you're actually in the OR, which I think is gonna really lead to better results and you've seen that clinically. We all know the benefits of MIS surgery that's been pretty well established. It's gonna reduce the collateral damage, reduce pain, get the patient out of the hospital fa faster. But there's also a surgeon longevity aspect to it. One of my mentors, Steve Ludwig, would always talk about the thoracal lumbar surgery as the blue collar surgery of spine. And I think by, by using robotics and these technologies, you can really make this a much more uh, surgery with finesse uh, and really, uh, decrease the amount of soft tissue retraction that you need to do and work that you need to do as a surgeon. The next area of progression and innovation that we, we've sort of moved along is how do we apply this now for MIS robotic surgery? So this is a, a smaller curve, this is about a 35 degree curve with severe stenosis due to this herniation. And you can again see, you can plan out your screws on the coronal and sagittal films uh, you can also plan out your incision. This is a very important part to make sure your incisions are going to line up and that they are not crossing each other. And you can facilitate what's called a screw cadence. We've all had issues where when we're doing jam sheet and needle percutaneous screws, the screws don't perfectly line up. If, even if your angle is off by about five degrees, it's going to make the rod passage a lot harder. And I'm sure with a raise of hand from our audience, 
how many people have had you know, struggle through the last part of the case when you're trying to pass the rod. So I think a huge part of uh, the planning uh, uh, advantage with the robotics is to make sure that there's good, great uh, screw cadence and that you can really pass this rod and it's a straight rod uh, on your coronal image. So here's the patient's uh, clinical photos and a post-operative x-ray. You can see the uh, great uh, books, uh, sagittal correction and coronal correction, and the minimal incision this patient had. You can compare it to this traditional surgery. Uh, and you know, you had, the patient had a small midline MIS decompression for that disc herniation. Well, the question is, well, how do you get the posterior aspect to fuse? How do you, get to, how do you actually lay down bone and decorticate the facet joint? And you can actually use a robot to do that. This is an innovation from uh, Dr. Good, where you can plan out the trajectory to the facet joint and use an ACL reamer and actually decorticate the facet joint and deliver bone graft to that area. And it's very powerful and a very innovative way of and getting this area to fuse. What about decompression? This is the area where you, know, you want to do a, a millimeter invasive decompression and you can actually plan out where you want the cannula to go. This is a patient who had a multi-level lateral percutaneous screws, and now we are using the robot to send out our, tuber, our tubes down to that area to really decompress the neuroframen. Here's a Woodson showing how the lateral recess of the framen was decompressed, and that we were able to achieve that using the robot, the robot to do that for us. Now we're going to go over to a little bit more of these extreme cases. This is a patient who had pseudoarthrosis uh, at a cortical case with um, Tila from another surgeon who had pseudoarthrosis, who also had adjacent segment disease and had a broken screw. And here is I'm going to show how you can use a robot to cannulate a previous tract where there's a broken screw and salvage this patient's pedicle uh, and be able to actually place a screw into that L5. And so here I was, you know, just cannulating using the tap to create a new track. Here is a, actually a very interesting case. This is a 62-year-old uh, female with a grade four spondylolisthesis case, severe neurogenic claudication, lumbar radiculopathy. And I'm going to turn it over to the to the audience and just kind of ask the question: What would you do? Uh, this is a case that we brought up our our spine conference. Uh, with the other surgeons, and there's a lot of debate what to do with this patient. Now, do you do just do an inside diffusion? Do you uh, do a T lift? Do you do the Bowman technique with the uh, fibular allograft, or do you do a corpectomy? And I'll, I'll, I would like to see what the participants say, and sort of talk about what we did and what how we were able to use the robotic technology to do this case. So, first of all, when you're trying to plan the screws, this is a very a beautiful illustration of how you can make smaller adjustments to avoid a screw. This is a screws from the front. The patient had standalone a lifts at L3, 4, and L4, 5. And I was able to avoid those screws by just using the robotic technology. Here is an image showing how narrow this and this plastic, this L5 pedicle is, and how here, when I was planning the screw, you can see that there's obstruction between the L4 and L5, L5 tulips. And by making small adjustments, I was able to avoid that problem. Here is a very important part of this procedure is the skin incision planning, right? Because of the acute angle of L5, initially the L5 was gonna look like this. So I was able to change the angle to make sure the L5, we're gonna enter the skin at a, at a much closer angle to the actual incision uh, to be able to achieve the surgery. How, how about the inner body planning and reduction planning? Here is, I actually planned out what the, the PLIF cages were gonna look like, how, what the size would be. And here, what I'm planning is actually understanding how much reduction do I need. So I'm measuring the distance from the tulip of S1 to L5, and it's about 12 millimeters. So, okay, I know my reduction screws that give me about 15 millimeters of reduction is gonna be enough. And here's the execution of this procedure. You can see the uh, S1 pedicles being placed. Here you can see how, uh, just like we planned, the, are, there's, there's small incisions we made for the L5 to be able to come in without having to extend this incision wider. So here we are placing an angled cob using our robotic uh, trajectory and placing our cages in uh, in that angle before the reduction. So here's the uh, post-operative uh, CT scan. You can see we got 
great reduction went from grade four to about grade two and he, here are the two t-lift cages just like we planned on the robot so what's on the horizon the horizon is really an integration of different technologies right from the this is a software and hardware planning imaging and then really these tools and i'm going to show you some of the more advanced tools that are coming out this is something that's familiar to a lot of people this is the stealth midas tools where you're essentially navigated tools right where we're making uh helping us make our trajectories or help us make our laminectomies. But really the next, that next level is gonna be the ultrasonic bone cutting tools, which are available right now, but now it's gonna become automated. So here's a video showing how you're gonna be able to use this bone scalpel knife and use the robot to plan out your central laminectomy. This is illustrating a two level laminectomy and really minimizing the trauma to the, to the, to the actual spinal structure. And so you're making a small cut through the interspinous ligament, unroofing this central lamina at two levels. And then you're using the bone scalpel to then undercut the facet joints to decompress the subarticular and lateral recess areas of the spine. And so this video is gonna go through all uh, two segments. And then you're going to be able to remove the um, disc herniation by mobilizing the dura away. And finally, you're going to be able to reconstruct the anatomy of the spine and suture the interspinous ligament uh, back together. The next video is going to show, okay, I want to do a more uh, millimeter invasive tubular type decompression. And so you can use your robot to come to that trajectory and then use the bone scaffolding tool. This is more like the sort of the bird type tool that we, we, some of us are familiar with, which does not uh, cut soft tissue, but cut, cuts the bone in, in a way that actually causes hemostasis to really make a very precise cut in the bone where we need to have decompression. This is showing the, some, of the, some of the available technology now that's coming out where you have navigated in a body uh, end plate preparation as well as cage placement, which is gonna become part of the robotic uh, armamentarium in terms of doing what we need to do to, to do better surgery. Uh, here's a software aspect, right? We have a lot of uh, companies coming out with what's called a dashboard where the patient's clinical information is, is in there. You're gonna have imaging analytics, PACS connectivity. You are also gonna have clinical outcome data here. And you're gonna integrate this with, this, with the planning software in order to build that in, in into your OR. And I think this is gonna be the what's called the ecosystem of, of spine. And what's gonna, what it's gonna allow us to do, you can see this is uh, my senior partner, Dr. Good, with all these trays here, right? But, a, but being able to really plan your surgery and understanding what, what you need, what screw sizes you need, what rod size you need, you're gonna have better predictability. And better predictability in the OR means less cost, right? Because you have less number of trays, next, uh, less number of shipping costs, you know, each tray for the hospital is about $300 per tray. So even though the robot, the upfront cost is, is not low, you're going to have a lot of cost savings that's going to be built into the system as you're doing more and more cases. So what does the future look like? It's really an integration of these technologies. And the next step is going to be what's called auto planning, where you're using predictive analytics and cloud-based learning for the, for the robot to really learn what, what are the no-fly zones are so that you can do auto planning. I think the last step is gonna be autonomous planning execution. Uh, I think that's probably a, a more than a decade away, but I think the, the, the next step is gonna be using these new tools and really integrating these technologies together to create an ecosystem just like we have at Apple uh, to really develop, deliver a transformation of spine surgery. Uh, I want to acknowledge my partners, Dr. Good here, Dr. Haynes, and myself. Uh, we have a visiting clinical program for the robot. 
please come and visit us. Eslan, thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, there were a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Um, how do you deal with skiving uh, during surgery or, or basically uh, when you're putting an instrumentation, you know, you, you think it's going in one direction and ends up a little bit, maybe a little off or uh, not exactly where you expect it to be. Are, are there any tips or tricks to, uh, you know, to, to reduce the chance of that happening and, and how do you deal with it if it happens? That's a great question. That's something that we've, we've uh, made a lot of uh, headway in terms of avoiding. Uh, a lot of it has to do with planning. When you're planning your screws, you got to make sure that you're, you're landing on, let me go back to the image so I can really demonstrate this really well. So here's a, Here's a, an example of, of an axial view, right? If you if you put your uh, if you're starting right here, this is what we call a medial sky potential, right? Because if there's any shift in the drill bit, it's going to sky medial. If you are putting your planning right on the edge of on this aspect of this facet joint, that's what's called the lateral sky potential. So some of it is planning. So this is for percutaneous cases. Uh, we actually have created this anti-sky pin where you, before you drill the, uh, the pedicle, you can actually use, it's almost like an all-tip uh, sky pin that help, helps to create an initial channel through the cortical bone to avoid that. And the next step is a, a, a bird that's going to go over the cannula that you actually can bird down that starting point. Uh, and so that's what, what we're developing in the lab right now with, with Medtronic. Um, I think that's going to avoid that, you know, a lot. A lot of it has to do with, in the beginning, you have to use the fluoro. So I have the fluoro parked in the lateral position, and I actually check uh, each time, uh, just take one shot to make sure I didn't sky, because you can also sky superior or inferior. In the open cases, it's really important for you to actually take this down with the rongeur. Uh, so I think it's a lot easier. You do a medial fasciotectomy, you just cut down and make sure you either burr or rongeur out the, these prominences. But for the percutaneous cases, it's very critical that you're really planning your, your screw right on this, on a flat surface, right? It has to be perpendicular to the drill bit to make sure you're not skiving. So that's a great question. Awesome. Uh, Jeremy, uh, there's a question for you. Actually, I, I uh, skipped it before, I apologize. So we're gonna get back to it. But uh, do you, when you're, in clinic with people and you're showing them um, uh, the virtual reality of their spine and surgery I've planned for them. Have you ever noticed anybody get a little bit overwhelmed or they get anxious from that? Have you seen any downsides to that? Um, I think, um, I think first of all, it's, I offer as an option. So like there's, particularly young patients are very interested in it, but, but most of my patients want to try it and see it. I've certainly had the 80 year old who says, I don't want to put on those goggles and that's okay. But I think for a lot of people, knowledge is, uh, knowledge is power. And I think what's more uh, anxiety provoking to a patient is, is giving them that list. You know, you're at, you know, the risk of surgery are this, 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 and not understanding why that is. And I think when they, you know, I think it's, it, it actually, I think, calms anxiety down because it's really like a thorough understanding of, of not only what, you know, what are the risks, but also what are we going to do to prevent those risks um, in, during surgery. So I, I think, uh, I think knowledge is power. Yeah. Has that ever been looked at? And I apologize for not knowing the literature. Usually I'm very on top of this, but has that ever been looked at the, uh, the how uh, AR and VR have um, enhanced the patient experience? That's one of the questions on that survey we're giving patients is, is, you know, how did it help you deal with the stress of surgery? Because it's, it's, it hasn't to my knowledge either. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Eshan and Jeremy. Mm. Is, oh, uh, can I ask a question? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead Sorry. You paused there. So I started talking. So I have a question about the robotics, more of a practical question about ergonomics and the radiation. So how is this going to help the surgeons, not just for the planning, but for themselves? Because, I see a lot about how surgeons have a lot of neck pain and fatigue and things like that. It seems like the robotics might play a role in that. You, you touched on that briefly. And one of the audience members also asked about the radiation 
and you mentioned not wearing lead in some cases. So yeah, because we're we're well, it depends on the case, but because we're taking minimal uh, X-ray, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times what I have is a lead screen in the OR, and so if I'm making taking those minimal shots, I just walk behind and take the shot. Uh, you know, after I'm behind that lead screen, so I don't have to wear lead constantly. When you're doing floral-based surgery, especially percutaneous surgery, you're you're getting a lot of shots, right? You're getting multiple shots to make sure that you are good in both planes. A lot of people will use two floral machines to do percutaneous screws, so it really helps uh, reduce that. In terms of ergonomics, you're absolutely right. When you're doing minimally invasive surgery, you're not your the, the amount of dissection that you're doing is very minimal, right? Especially with percutaneous surgery compared to really having to, you know, retract the muscle, retract all the way down to the TPs. That's a lot of retraction time. That's a lot of looking down and looking in that you're avoiding and really reducing your neck pain and really increasing the, the surgeon longevity. Thank you. Hey, John, we had a, uh, another great question um, from uh, Dr. Selby um, about, uh, you know, obviously robotics are fairly cost prohibitive for a lot of institutions. Um, Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Giazzini, what, what's been your experience with maybe some alternative workflows or what sort of opportunities have you seen for maybe those surgeons who aren't able to get a robot or, or, or one of these uh, augmented or virtual reality systems to try and replicate the system as best they could with uh, more limited resources? Uh, I think a lot of hospitals and a lot of the company, now, now that, you know, the Mazur was bought by uh, Medtronic, they do have a lot of you know, contracts where you can set up sort of a, you know, you can usage deals where if you use a certain amount of the, their metal, you're going to be able to, you know, get that technology. Um, with the Augmetics, uh, it's not, it's a lot cheaper. So it's not, it doesn't have as much upfront, co upfront cost. Um, I think it's going to be difficult without either, you know, getting into a contract with, with using your hospital and really advocating for why this is important for your patients. I think that's the most important thing. I think the hospitals will, will be willing to help you acquire this technology if you can demonstrate to them, hey, this is going to make my OR efficiency better. This is going to, you know, in the future, like I showed in terms of uh, reducing your inventory costs uh, and decreasing the amount of waste that there is and in terms of turnover uh you can then demonstrate that value i think if, if you should if you can demonstrate value to the hospital administrators i think uh and partner with them i think that's the best way to sort of acquire these technologies uh as long as you can demonstrate that um and i think it's it's um it's the onus is on us as surgeons to demonstrate that value and we're doing a lot of great research on robotics uh both retrospective and prospective to demonstrate that clinical value but there's also economic value that's that's there, and I think that you have to really demonstrate both of those to be able to bring this to your hospital. Hundred percent echo that, Esan. And I think uh, you know if you save two return to ORs for errant pedicle screw placement, you know, then you know you've already saved you you've already saved potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, I think for exactly what you said, if we show that it, not only everything you said on top of that, if we just decrease our complications and and return to or you know i think once that's proven it's going to be hard to make an economic case against the robots and the new technology